Welcome back to Carnades.org. In honor of getting halfway through the lovely 100 days of logic, we're going to be doing a video continuing our series on doubting math. This one is going to be on Gödel's incompleteness theorem. Now, I warn you, this is going to be a pretty technical video. I'm going to try to simplify it down as much as I can, but Gödel's incompleteness theorem is pretty complicated. If you haven't watched my video on Russell's Paradox, you definitely should do that, and if you don't feel too comfortable with logic, I would suggest you watch some of my videos from the 100 Days of Logic before continuing. If you watch this video and you still have no idea what I'm talking about, wait and finish out the 100 Days of Logic. The final week we're going to do is going to give you a lot more insight into the kind of stuff we're talking about here. Okay, with that out of the way, Quick admonition is a basic introduction to Gödel's incompleteness theorem. It's a really complicated theorem. All we're really talking about here are kind of the repercussions of the theorem, not the way that it's proved or anything like that. If you want more information, check out on formally undecidable propositions of Principia Mathematica and related systems by Kurt Gödel or Gödel's incompleteness theorems in the Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy. Whew, with that out of the way, let's get started. So, when last we left our hero, Math, he was trapped in the jaws of Russell's paradox. We had the problem of the set of all sets that are not members of themselves, and that set is both a member of itself and not a member of itself. This was a problem for set theory, and therefore it was a problem for math. However, dun -dun -dun -dun, to the rescue is going to come Zermelo Frankel set theory. Now, this set theory is going to find a way around Russell's paradox, but it's going to cause some more problems in that set theory that will eventually lead us to kind of an understanding of why no set theory is ever going to be perfect, which is basically Gödel's incompleteness theorem. But I'm getting ahead of myself. So, this theory says that the problem with kind of naive set theory is the comprehension principle. Russell's paradox relies on the naive comprehension principle, which goes as follows. There exists an A such that for all X, X is a member of A if and only if condition V applies. If you had no idea what I just said, try to follow along as we go on. So, the naive comprehension principle, once again, is there exists some set A such that for all X, X is a member of A if and only if condition V applies. Basically, what this is saying is condition V is kind of how we would know if something's a member of the set A or not. X is a member of that set, and A is the set itself. Okay? The problem is, when we use the naive comprehension principle, we see, let phi be X is not a member of itself. If A is a member of A, so we're letting X be A in this case, if A is a member of A, then condition phi does not apply, and A is not a member of A. So, we have a little bit halfway there to a contradiction. If A is not a member of A, then phi does apply, and A is in fact a member of A, and we're stuck in a loop, we're stuck in the paradox. This is Russell's paradox, and this is why it's a problem for this kind of basic, naive comprehension principle. Zermelo and Frankel are going to solve this problem by getting rid of the naive comprehension principle and replacing it with something that I cannot pronounce. This is going to be Zermelo, I'm not even going to try. Z-A is what it's referred to, that's what I'm going to refer to it. As. I believe it's called the, it means the separation axiom in German, but don't quote me on that. It is, for all A there exists a B such that for all X, X is a member of B if and only if X is a member of A and condition phi applies. Once again, for all sets A, there exists a set B such that for all X, X is a member of B if and only if X is a member of A and condition phi holds. Whew! That was complicated. Let's take a look at how this does, in fact, get out of Russell's paradox. So, once again, for all sets A, there exists a set B such that for all X, X is a member of B, if and only if X is a member of A, and condition phi holds, we're going to try the paradox again. Let phi, once again, be X is not a member of itself, and let A be the universal set, the set of all things, the biggest set we could possibly get to fit B in. If B is a member of B, so B we're going to put in for X in this case. If B is a member of B, then B is a member of the universal set, and condition phi applies. So, B is not a member of itself. Uh-oh, we seem to be halfway on our way to the paradox. The problem is, and the way they're going to get out of it, is if B is not a member of B, then condition phi does apply. Therefore, 
B cannot be a member of the universal set. The reason it can't be a member of the universal set is basically we know that condition phi applies, but we also know that B is not a member of B. So it's not going to be the case that B is a member of A and condition phi applies. The only way that we can get that is if we remember from De Morgan's Law, when we have the negation of a conjunction, we have to negate either one or the other of those things. We can't negate phi because we already have phi, so we're going to have to negate B being a member of A. And if B can't be a member of A, if B can't be a member of the universal set, then it's not the universal set, because it's not the set of all things, because there is some set B that is not in the universal set. So, what we're going to conclude, and I'm sorry that that was really, really confusing, what we're going to conclude is, therefore, the universal set does not exist. Whew. In a future video, I will do that out in propositional form to show you exactly why that works as it does. For now, if you didn't understand, just trust me that it does. So, the problem is we solved the paradox, but we've lost the ability to have the universal set in our ontology. This is kind of the chink in the armor, and there's going to be a lot of other problems that build out of this paradox and the things we have to do to get around the many paradoxes. That's going to be the, like I said, chink in the armor, the bearer of bad news for math. This leads us to where we were trying to get to our long girdles in completeness theorem. So, first, some definitions. A system is complete. If, for every statement in a language of the system, either the statement or its negation can be derived. A system is consistent if no statement and its negation are both derivable. For those of you who like logic, think of consistent being the law of non-contradiction, no statement and its negation can be derived, and a complete system being the law of the excluded middle that all statements are either true or false, and they can be derived to be either true or false. Here, now, is Gödel's incompleteness theorem. Part 1. There's two. Any consistent formal system F, those are systems like um, the zermelo frankel system, within which a certain amount of elementary arithmetic can be carried out, is incomplete. In effect, there are statements of the language F which can neither be proved nor disproved in F. Basically, if the system is consistent, it cannot be complete. Let's take a look at a bit more of a visualization of this. So, imagine this is our system, ZCF. That's actually the zermelo frankel choice version of it. Anyway, and we can prove axiom A, we can prove B, we can prove C, we can prove D. Eventually, there's going to be some Thing that we cannot prove either the truth or the falsehood of that needs to be a part of the system. We'll call that E. There might be some other system that could prove E, but inevitably there's going to be some thing that that system can't prove, perhaps that the first system could prove. There may even be something that neither system could prove, which will bring us to Gödel's Incompleteness Theorem Part 2. This is the statement, this is a corollary from the original. For any consistent system F within which a certain amount of elementary arithmetic can be carried out, the consistency of F cannot be proved in F itself. So one of those statements that system F cannot prove is that system F is consistent. Wow. All right. What that means is one of those statements that's outside the reach of our system is that that system is consistent. Whew. All right, I'll leave you with a quote from the Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy to kind of explain why I touched on Russell's paradox first and said that that was such a big problem for Matt. Russell's paradox is one of the original conceptual sins leading to our expulsion from Cantor's paradise. Watch this video and more at carnades.org and stay skeptical, everybody.